I uh, I have my same meeting on Discord. Okay, so if you watch, if you've seen the first part, you're just having an intro music you can listen to in the background. Um, if you have not seen the first part, here here are the notes. You can see in the it's you can see it in JCord. You can see the notes from the first lecture that I posted. I'm sorry I couldn't post in the first part. I I messed up. I'll keep this page stream. Uh, when and things are going on, but you can you can pause and read the notes for yourself at any time in this video. I'll make them bigger. As you can see, everything that I noted while I was reading the books and presented in the lecture, everything is in here. If it helps you, uh, if you want to see it 24/7, you want to be able to see it all the time. You can go to J Chord. Uh, visit the Orthodox Christian Discord and uh, and yeah you can you can see all of this stuff for yourself and this last is St. John Damascus in the Ethiopian Synaxarium so I'm not making stuff up uh, and we'll start pretty 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 soon I hope Father Deacon comes but it starts with prayer like last time uh, but yeah so until that happens enjoy the music and in two minutes we'll start That shall be enough music. Just gotta get the settings right and All right. Uh just gonna test things out. Can you guys hear me? If you can hear me, type in VC lecture. Like last time, you can type stuff in VC lecture. I will be posting notes live, so you can check the, check them in the lecture notes. Um, if you have missed the first part, then don't worry. The first part is going to be uploaded. All right, great. The first part is going to be uploaded on the YouTube channel. It will be posted on here. You'll be you'll know. So if you missed that, you can go check that out. If you and if you missed this one, I mean. If you miss this one, you won't be here. But if you have to leave early, uh, you can check the rest of it on YouTube as well. So it will all be on the YouTube channel. Um, just like, kind of like last time, There's I'm going to be doing a mid-lecture Q&A and then an end of the lecture Q&A. And you can ask me any questions. If you want to defend your position, 
uh feel free to even ask questions you can debate uh i'm not gonna not gonna bite you if i do that it, it will make me look bad <laughs> and uh and also for other reasons but uh like last time i believe father deacon is not here he started with prayers last time so i'm gonna start with a uh, uh, simple prayer and let's get this show down the road so in the name of the in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit i mean glory to you god or glory to you O heavenly king comfort the spirit of truth who are in all place and fill all things treasure of good things and giver of life come and dwell in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls O gracious lord and all right let's begin so last time uh we went over the history the historical context i will the th some of the things i'm going to say i'm going to assume you have some idea of what we talked about i will still reference them and uh to ca catch you guys up to speed and as i said when the q a happens you can ask basic questions even just to uh help me clarify what i'm saying because it's very difficult for me to explain some of these things. It takes a lot of time. It takes uh, it takes a lot of effort. And sometimes I forget that uh, some people might not know some of the other stuff. And I just assume people know that. So if you want me to clarify some of the things in the Q&A, this is the perfect opportunity. And I, in this, in this part, I want to start by talking about our position first. Uh, what, what, what is our Christology? And I think that's the best way to start because we kind of have to, in order to start even distinguishing, we have to kind of know what we believe and then we have to see what they believe and and then I can tell you what are the problems I see in, in from my perspective uh, when I look at the Oriental Christology. And, uh, a lot and a lot of the stuff that I talk about has been said in a in a in a video of mine that I'll link later on in the lecture. But uh, style Severus of Antioch and it's it's one of the videos of history of Christ Christian theology. A lot of it is going to be from there. I'm going to try to make it a bit quicker and I'm going to try to focus on some other things. But uh, I want to start by talking about orthodox terms and what they mean. So when I talk about the, these terms. I mean it specifically in the context of how we use it, right? Especially today, particularly, how we use them today. And I think a good start will be understanding what hypostasis means. Today, we understand hypostasis. It's pretty much synonymous with person. Uh, hypostasis refers to existence. It refers, it means person. And, the, and I will elaborate what I mean on what I'm about to say next. It is where natures and things, properties, wills, energies, where they come to be, where they come to exist. Uh, you can call it existence. You can call it mode of being. You can call this person. We use it, you, we use it to mean person first and foremost. And I will talk more extensively about hypostasis because it is crucial. Um, essence refers to the genus. It refers to the species of that thing. It answers the question, what is that thing, right? So hypostasis answers the question of who. Essence answers the question of what is that thing, right? So what is this thing? Like if I if I hold a chair and I say, what is this thing? The answer is the es essence of that thing is chair. So it's a chair, right? If I point towards myself and ask, who is this? You, you realize, your answer is, this. well, that's David. Right. So my hypothesis asks the question, who? Nature uh, is synonymous with essence. However, it describes something different as well. So nature means a particular genus. So it, it means it, it means essence, but it means essence that is particularized in a person. So it's the same thing as essence, except it's it's particular. It exists in a hypostasis um, because it's synonymous for example, to say my human nature and my human essence, they're not, they're, it, you, to, using these expressions is not wrong, but uh, nature more so refers to particular nature, whereas essence refers to a common nature. Uh, will is a faculty that bears the things it is capable to will. Uh, it is intrinsically connected with energy. You can call it activity as well. So, for example, what I mean by that is that you cannot have one will and two energies in a hypostasis. It, they have to be numerically identical, basically, because they are connected. The will you can think of is kind of like the volition of the energy, and the energy is 
So for example, if I will, I can will to walk five meters right in front of me. Right? If I will that, I use my human energies, my human activities to accomplish that task. So energy and will has that kind of a relation. But will, the term will has its own distinctions in it. So there is the object of willing, and that means the, the that answers the question of what is being willed. Uh, and I will be I'll be copying and pasting this section. Uh, all right, object of willing. This will be in uh, Manavsa lecture notes. The object of willing, uh, object of willing means what is being willed. Uh, Batrelos Dimitrios Batrelos in Byzantine Christ page one eighteen says. St. Maximus elaborates the distinction of this by, in, in his first Diatelite Opusculum, he argues that although God and the saints may have the same object of filling, because in heaven, the saints and God will the same things, but the question he's dealing with, if the saints and God will the same things, then don't they have the same will? And his answer is that no, they don't, because although their natural wills are different, what they will is the same. So it's the object of willing that's the same. Uh, it is what is being willed. So their will still remains distinct even in, in the afterlife uh, for, for the saints and whatnot. Uh, and then there is the mode of willing and the mode of willing is proper to hypostasis. It's mode of, <clears throat> mode of willing refers to the will that is how the will is actualized and particularized. And again, I will quote from uh, Batrellus's book on Byzantine Christ in here. Uh, he says, the mode of willing is the particular way in which the will is actualized vis-a-vis -vis its objects and differs among persons. So according to Maximus, the mode of willing, like the mode of seeing, that is to will to walk or to will not to walk and to see right or left or up or down or to see out of con concupiscence or to see in order to understand a logia of beings is a mode of the use of willing and seeing and belongs only to him who uses it. So in the context of the Trinity, although there is only one will in the Trinity because there's one nature and all the persons in the Trinity are united in essence, um, there are three modes of willing. So uh, if you read Free Choice in St. Maximus the Confessor, uh, St. Maximus, for example, outlines the mode of willing of the Father according to good pleasure, the, the mode of willing... Uh, of the Son according to economy and the mode of willing of the Holy Spirit according to consent and for confirmation. So the persons in the Trinity have distinct modes of willing because it's proper to their personhood, but their will is the same. It's the same divine will. So there's no division in willing. There's no disagreements. There is no uh, gnomic willing, which is uh, deliberation. Right? They don't deliberate what is good or what is bad. They are the good. They know the good. Uh, to will to eat or not to will to eat or to will to walk or not to will to walk is not a negation of the natural, but it's a negation of the mode of willing, namely the coming to being and the passing out of existence of the objects of willing. Uh, and so to summarize what will means, will is proper to nature, but it's the person that utilizes the will. Uh Thus, the Trinity is three persons, but still has one natural will because of the unity of essence. The, the word energy, you can call this activity. It's a procession of will. It's, it's proper to nature. Um, it is, as I said, the activity of walking, right? Or God's divine energy. For example, God's divine energy of creating the world. God's divine energy of um, turning water into wine, right? These are divine activities that God possesses, that God does. And, uh, and as I said, energy is, is proper to the nature uh, that person possesses. So to essentially summarize our Christological belief, and if you want a good summary of a post calcedonian Christology on the dogmatic level, I will recommend you check out St. Sophronius of Jerusalem. St. Sophronius, uh, his confession, uh, St. Sophronius' synodical confession, this is dogmatized in the Sext Ecumenical Council, so it's a very good basic expression of orthodox christology it's not really long the the book is kind of long because of but half more than half the book i think is introduction and written by like the translators 
Um, I think the actual confession itself is, I want to say 20 to 30 pages. I'm not 100% sure, but it's not really particularly long. So it's a very good read if you want to understand the Orthodox position fully explained by an Orthodox saint. But to summarize, we will say Christ is one person in two natures. Uh, he as a person before the incarnation was a simple divine hypostasis and he only had the divine nature before the incarnation. But through the Virgin Mary, uh, the Theotokos, he got his human nature and this human nature exists in his personhood. So that he is not united to another person. There's not another person being born. It's the same person that adapts, adopts a new mode of being. So now he acquires the characteristics of human nature in his personhood through a hypostatic union. So when we hear the term hypostatic union, it's a union according to hypostasis. It's a union in the hypostasis. A union according to hypostasis is a term St. Cyril of Alexandria uses in the before 433, I believe 17 times or 18 times. And that's his most used term um, before 433. Uh, I'm pretty sure Hans von Lund says this in St. Cyril of Alexandria's Diophysa Christology. So it's a union in his hypostasis according to his hypostasis. That's why it's a hypostatic union. He is in two natures because the two natures exist in him indivisibly, but they are still distinct, right? So the two natures are still there. They exist. Um, they retain their identity. He's out of two natures because the two natures are united in his hypothesis and are composed and the two become one. The two are made one as various different saints use that expression to become one. So he's also out of two natures. These both Christological expressions that were kind of in a dialectic in the Chalcedonian period, the Orthodox Church under, in, Chalced, uh, in the Fifth Ecumenical Council with St. Justinian understands that these terms express are completely congruent with each other. And Christ is also his two natures. So the one person is his two natures because the two natures that exist in him are his, right? So his human body, it's his human body. Is his human soul. So Christ is not united. So his unity, his, his unity with the human nature is not like his unity with us because his unity with us is like his unity with the prophets, with the, with the saints. It's a different kind of unity. It's a union according to grace. It's not a hypostatic unity. Whereas the two natures in Christ, it's the natures are his. And so um, although he's not identical with his two natures, so uh, divine nature plus human nature equals Jesus Christ is not true. He's not identical, but he's identified with his two natures because of the new characteristics that he has attained. So having basically summarized the Orthodox position, let's move on to understanding what hypostasis is. And I, and I, think, and I think focusing on this is important because it helps us understand what our position is. And when we look at the oriental position later on, we will understand how it is distinct. In what manner is it distinct more so? So uh, historically speaking, uh, historically speaking, uh, hypostasis had multiple different definitions. Uh, the most basic definition that you can think of at the time was a, it, they called it a concrete essence with particular characteristics. And, and stuff like that. But these words, you know, so it needed a more elaborate kind of a definition. But the problem with elaborate definitions, especially in regards to hypostasis, is we treat hypostasis as apophatic. So when we look at personhood, we don't say personhood is this. Personhood is his own thing. But we don't say personhood is identical to this or is this. But rather we say personhood is not this. And if you look at the controversy, for example, with Apollinarianism, this is the approach of St. Gregory of Nyssa. For Apollinarius, pers um, personhood was a faculty of the mind. Personhood was mind. At times he will say personhood was not mind, but it's something inside the mind, right? So if you have a mind, you have personhood. So that's kind of like one of his arguments. And St. Gregory of Nyssa and the Cappadocian response is no, uh, personhood is not residing in the mind. It's not the mind. Uh so there's, there's that to consider. And I want to post this from the book. This is from the book um, Defense of the Council of Chalcedon, Hypostasis and Deification Leontes of Jerusalem in the 6th century. 
And I think this is a really good book for you to read to understand the Kirillic Chalcedonian period before the Fifth Ecumenical Council and to understand what their Christology was. So uh, Leontius of Jerusalem is he's an important uh, Kirillic Chalcedonian uh, Christologist and a lot of what he says is said by St. Maximus, St. John of Damascus, uh, and many other many other saints that that deal with the same topic, and he gets his Christology obviously from Saint Cyril of Alexandria and the earlier Cappadocians. So there's a there's a line in here that he follows. He says hypostasis refers to when particular different natures together with their properties, but not their prosopa, meaning their persons, come together in union in the same thing under one existence. And then he says, so then hypostasis is called existence uh, or existing together, which is conceived in a particular subject, either in simplicity or in composition, either in that which is particular or that which is common as in the Godhead. Uh, wait, let me get to my notes. Yep. And I and I will post some couple of other pages to help you to showcase the summarization of um, the summarization of these positions. Um, Leontius explicitly states that when the term hypostasis that when the term hypostasis refers to the coming together of several natures, it does not include the coming together of their persons, their prosopa, uh, or their mass or their external realities as we've covered in the previous lecture. One should note carefully that the term hypostasis itself is not the coming together of natures or of properties. So it's not identical with natures or the natures coming together, but it is the center where those uni where the union, uh, where the synthesis is absurd. So in other words, the hypostasis itself is not a union or coming together, but it is that in which the union or coming together takes place. And to, uh, so, for example, in the in the example of human na human persons, uh, the union of the body and soul, which we call human nature, the union of the body and soul comes together in the human person. Third, in the case of natures coming together, the properties are associated with the natures; they're not associated with the hypostasis, uh, and they don't constitute the hypostasis, as Saint Basil the Great says in letter uh, letter thirty eight. They are not. A hypostasis is not a conglomeration of uh, it's not a conglomeration of properties. However, the hypostasis, the person manifests the properties. So the, the properties again come to existence through the hypostasis. So there's a very personal aspect of Orthodox Christology. Uh so to summarize, the basic characteristics of hypostasis is that it may be constituted of several natures or of one nature, of several properties or of one. Its constitution may be simple or composite. It may be particular or common, but the hypostasis itself is simple and not composite. It is that in which the simple or co composite constitution is observed. So, uh, and as, as such, it is distinguishable in thought from the nature and its properties. In thought refers to Distinction catepinoia, it's a it's an actual distinction that happens, but we come to realize it in our mind. I covered this in the first part. I covered this in multiple different videos. And um and so there is a kind of like a confusing terminology for a lot of people at, at first glance. So it's composite, but at the same time it's simple. So the hypostasis in and of itself is simple, but because the composition occurs in the hypostasis. The hypostasis can also be spoken of composite because of the natures coming together. And this will be explained more in detail in a couple of more minutes. Um, until then, uh, I'll, I'll move on with, with, the, with the section. And, okay. and so at the time of the post-Chalcedonian period, There was kind of like a confusion over defining terms in the Chalcedonian side. So, let me give me a second. So, for instance, for John the Grammarian, who was a Chalcedonian who defended his position against monophysitism, 
he defined personal hypostasis as as I said before, a, con a concrete essence, a concretized essence with particular characteristics. And we see the same thing happening in the Antis of Jerusalem, but there's a distinction there. There's a distinction of how that's understood. So for John the Grammarian and for a lot of the, not only for John the Grammarian, but also for his opponents, right, the Monophysites and uh, as well the Severan Miaphysites and whatnot, for him, the hypostasis is definitively the essence with concrete characteristics. For Leontes of Jerusalem, it is not definitively the case. It, it is descriptively the case. So one of them understand that this term defines personhood. The other understand it merely describes it. It does not define it. So my personhood is not my essence with my accidental particular characteristics. However, my personhood can be explained, right? So, for example, uh, let's let's say, for example, you have a a runner, right? That person is a runner, right? Him being a runner describes who he is as a person. But is he personally identical to being a runner? If he was the case, well, for example, if he stopped running, let, let's say he got an injury and he can't run anymore. He's not a runner anymore. So did it change as a person? Is he a different person now? Right, so should we give him a different name? Should we does does he go to a new birth or anything like that? Did he die and just had a rebirth? It doesn't make any sense if we had that kind of an approach. Is my point right? So similarly, uh, actually, I'll, I'll move on with that. But I I I will assume that you get what I'm talking about, and I'll and I'll move on. So as I said, John the Grammarian thinks the hypostasis is the particular nature of characteristics. Uh, Leontius of Jerusalem distinguishes hypostasis and nature. St. John Damascus says famously that the root of all error is the failure to distinguish nature and person, right? And Leontius distinguishes these terms, and he says that the hypostasis is the essence with concrete characteristics only in a descriptive sense. So let's get into uh, in hypostatization and hypostasis into, more de into much more detail. And I will show you an excerpt from a PowerPoint slide from one of my videos. And if you've seen that video, you, you probably know this slide, what, I, what I'm about to say. Um, the in hypostatization refers to the essence being particularized in a person, right? So, for example, in the case of Christ, his two natures are in hypostatized in his hypostasis because they come to being in his persons and they are united in his person person so you can call it particularization as well if you want to um, there are three aspects of hypostasis that i want to touch upon because this is i think very very important uh, there's a personal hypostasis there's material aspect of hypostasis and there's a formal as aspect of hypostasis the personal aspect refers to the personhood um, it asks the question of who and it's the I. It's it's simple. It is not composite. It's not composed of things, right? So, for example, again, in the case of me, uh, my personhood doesn't change. It's not composed of different parts, uh, and it is simple, right? It's not composed, as I said before. So, for example, the me, my personal hypostasis ten years ago is exactly the same with the personal hypostasis of me today. There's no change. There's no difference. It's this exact same thing because I remain, I retain my identity. With the case of Christ, the post-incarnate Christ and the pre-incarnate Logos are the same exact person. They're the same exact personal hypostasis. There's absolutely no change there. Material hypostasis, however, refers to the natures existing in the hypostasis. Uh, so you can say it is the whole that is made up of two holes that play the role of a part, if that makes sense. It is... Uh, the personal hypostasis is asymmetrical, material is symmetrical, and um, we will say in that level, Christ's hypostasis materially is composite. And let me give you an example from again my uh, from an anthropological standpoint. Uh, my material hypostasis will be my body and soul. If you hold me by my hand, for example, if you hold me by my arm and you're trying to you know drag me to some place, you are dragging my body but my body is associated with my personhood right so 
even though you're dragging my body, you're still dragging me, even though you're not dragging my personal hypostasis in that sense. Another aspect is, as, as I've given the example before, ten, the 10 years, uh, me 10 years ago and me today are the same person. At the same time, on a material level, that is absolutely not true. Me 10 years ago is completely different. I've endured change. I've changed in height. I've changed in personality in some manner. I've uh, I've changed in how I look and, 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 and things such as these. So there is a change in my hypostasis. But there's, this change, for example, happens in the body, uh, in my body. Uh, you can say, oh, David changed. He's a different person from 10 years ago. But at the same time, I'm the same exact person. And once you understand it on that level, it becomes much more clear. And so these are crucial aspects that you need to distinguish. And finally, there is the formal hypostasis. Uh, these are, uh, you can say, kind of like marks, idioms that uh, distinguishes the hypostasis from other hypostases. Um, so it doesn't define personal hypostasis, but it describes it. And as I, as I give from the example, let's again, um, let's think of uh jay dyer right the owner of this discord jay dyer is the owner of this discord right that's his that's a personal characteristic that separates and distinguishes him from other people he uh he has i believe 70k subs that distinguishes him from other youtubers as a youtube channel it distinguishes him from non-youtubers so you get the point here these are things that distinguish one person from the other it doesn't define the personhood, but it describes the personhood and helps us distinguish them. Or with the persons of the Trinity, right? The Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, and the Holy Spirit is processed, right? So these uh, personal characteristics describe the different persons in the Holy Trinity so that we can distinguish the persons in the Holy Trinity. And once we understand these three aspects of hypostasis, it will help us understand easier uh, how this union happens, how this union operates, and uh, and how this union properly exists without causing the problem of Nestor either Nestorianism or monophysitism, right? So I want to show you some other uh, couple of pages from the book. Leontius addresses the understanding of hypostasis as a particular nature or essence in against Nestorians. So he has a book against Nestorians, and um, his argument and and his argument is, by the way, he says that if particular if hypostasis meant particular essence, for example, then that will be tritheism. Then you will have three different essences because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have distinguishing marks. But these have to be essential qualities, so you have three essences and you have three gods as a result, according to his theology. And his opponents kind of accuse him of that as well, and he elaborates his position. Um, after having diligently studied the matter, that hypostases are nothing other than particular natures. So if we say that the two natures in Christ are particular, or at least one of them, that is the humanity, then we should understand that there are also two hypostases. Uh, let me post the other, other page, so I forgot to do that as well. Uh, there we go. Uh, so he says here what I was saying. For example, if the hypostates are nothing but particular essences, uh, then you must also say that there are three essences. And, and then you have insinuated by your blasphemy a threefold God into the dispensation of our Lord. So he's basically saying in your position, in the Nestorian position, this leads to tritheism, this kind of Christological understanding. So not only is Nestorianism resulting in two distinct, two di different persons that we call Christ, it just leads to three different gods as well because of their Christological mistakes. Um, and in this page, he, he makes the argument, uh, oh, this page is not loading from my side. Ah, well, I'll I'll still I'll still describe it. Uh, where is it? All right. He says we can rec okay, we can recognize your nonsense by another argument. If there were a particular essence of Matthew, 
then it will differ in no respect from the particular essence of Mark, since both maintain the same principle and definition. And if hypostasis was that, it will basically mean they're both the same person. If they're different people, then they will have different essences. And uh, that doesn't make any sense, he, his argument is. Uh, Leon, and I will. All right. And in terms of why the hypostasis, in what sense can the hypostasis be, of Christ be composite? He says that the hypostasis cannot be composite personally because it will imply two separate existences in one existence, which is Nestorianism, basically. And, uh, uh, but the, the composition happens in the hypostasis. So in that sense, we can speak of a hypostatic composition, which refers to the two natures united in Christ. Uh, so he doesn't change, but at the same time, he acquires new things uh, without changing. And if you have seen the debate I did with Paul Ibrahim on, um, and Daniel Kotkish on OO versus EO debate, he, he specifically made the point that a hypostasis is just a conglomeration of its properties. Uh, and he also said that we distinguish hypostasis and nature and essence, and I mean essence, person and essence, like how we distinguish particular in common. So they're not really distinct. They are only distinct in the sense of, you know, whether they're particular or not. And so if that is the case, uh, then the accidental properties will become essential properties. So, for example, green eyes, right? Green eyes will be essential properties too because, uh, because it is still part of the essence in that system. So there is no proper distinction. Uh, and that's, that's one of the issues of his view is that it leads to that problem as well. So not only is this probably in Nestorianism, but I will say in his view, uh, this is also the, the same issue that happens. On nature, will, and energy, and triandricity, uh, so this, this section I will be talking about, in what sense can we speak of one nature? In what instance can we speak of one will, one energy in Christ? Um, the one incarnate nature formula has three orthodox interpretations. So we have three different interpretations of that formula that all are orthodox. Um, the first interpretation is by saying one nature of God, the Word, and flesh, we imp already imply two natures, uh, one nature that is enfleshed uh, and the nature that enfleshes the other nature. Uh, so, for example, one nature of God, uh, meaning the divine nature, has become enfleshed with human nature. That is an orthodox view. Uh, number two will be by saying one nature of God, the word enfleshed. Uh, we consider it synonymous with one hypostasis of God, the word enfleshed. In fact, um, St. Cyril changed this formula to that, uh, to, to Mia Hypostasis, I believe, when he was dealing with the Antiochians in 433. So this is how St. Cyril sees, and this is also how mainstream Monophysites see. So for Severus of Antioch and uh, Philoxenus of Mabok and various other uh, Monophysite saints, this is how they see as well. So this is their, their normative view. Number three, by saying one nature of God, the word in flesh, we are saying that the nature has become one in unity. So the, I mean, as, as in the essence, right? Uh, we don't mean by, by saying that we don't mean that there's one essence, a Christic essence, but rather the unity, uh, because there is no separation, we can speak of this kind of a oneness uh, where they retain their duality in their oneness, in their unity, in their henosis. But even in their oneness, their identity is are their identity is retained, which means there are still two at the end of the day. Uh, we can we can use this analogy for the Trinity, and I like this analogy. In the Trinity, we say one nature, three persons. In in the in in Christ, we say one person, two natures. Uh, so there is there is that aspect as well. So duality or or essentially plurality and unity are not uh, dialectically opposite realities. So you can have distinctions without division or separation in our system. So we do 
and this is the basis of how we understand uh, theology in general. And in Christ, they are undivided in reality and they have truly become one, right? The two become one because the two natures are un united and, and hypostatized in the Logos and the hypostasis as a result is still one. It's still one person. Now, there might be an objection from Monophysites at this, at this section. They're going to read this and, and this is the uh, argument that um, I not Sh not Pope Shenouda, but uh, I believe V.C. Samuel makes this objection. Uh, kind of like this when he's talking about St. John Damascus' in high positization. And he says, okay, look, um, you guys believe that the human nature and the divine nature are both complete, right? They're fully, right? They're full. But to speak of a fully human nature, you you have to necessitate a hypostasis, right? So because, first of all, nature cannot exist without its hypostasis. And by that logic, the human nature of Christ needs to have its human hypostasis, which is why in your system, you should have two hypostases in reality if you want to retain the fullness of the human nature. And my response, and this will be Leontius of Jerusalem's response to, to this argument, here's, here's our response. And it is essentially the same response of St. Gregor of Nyssa. The term nature is not defined in relation with other terms. So, for example, we don't define nature in relation with hypostasis. The, the, its definition is its own independent thing, you can say. And this is important because to, to be f a full nature, you don't need it you don't need a corresponding hypostasis you need a hypostasis to exist but not a corresponding one and this is the crucial point because again we distinguish nature and person we distinguish nature and hypostasis and because of this you can have a fully human nature existing in a divine hypostasis so the hypostasis of the human nature is the divine hypostasis of the logos and so we don't have that problem, right? And again, we don't define nature uh, in, this, in, in its relation with other things. Its definition is its own. Because if we define it as other things, then we're not really s properly distinguishing nature and person. And so that's why this objection, I will say, does not stand. <clears throat> and finally, uh, well, not fine, but to kind of end this section, because I've been, I've been going on, this has been pretty long, just covering this, covering our own Christology. Uh, this doesn't, this doesn't show up, but you can click the link and, and see the screenshot if it works out. The uh, aunties used the analogy of uh, red hot iron and I'll just read the section. He says, we do not understand that the human nature came into being in its own particular hypostasis that belonged to it alone. That is to say that belonged to a mere man but rather that the human nature came into being in the pre-existent hypostasis of the Logos, in which are joined together with the properties and attributes of the human nature, and in the concurrence of both natures, and from both natures, and from the characteristics which are heaped up in the person derived from both essences, he manifests himself to be one prosopon, one person who is one of the Holy Trinity. And his hypostasis truly is one by itself, and it is not human. Uh, for it possesses the divine nature and properties, as in the hypostasis in and of itself, right? The personal hypostasis. And yet it exists not only in, the divine, in divine properties, for it adds to the set of divine characteristics those of the nature it has assumed. And he gives the example of uh, red-hot iron. While the lump of iron already exists in its own hypostasis, when it is put into the fire, the nature of the fire springs up in the hypostasis of the iron never at any time existing in its own hypostasis, but in the hypostasis of the iron. So fire does not have a fire hypostasis of its own to be united. It is now united with the iron. So its hypostasis is not fire, it's the iron. Then when the iron is brought out of the furnace, the fire possesses even outside the furnace, the hypostasis of the iron in its own true form, and yet the fire in the furnace is undiminished. Another analogy I like using is the is um, fire burning on water? I use this against Muslims. I think this is the best analogy you can use. So, Muslims usually say uh, Christ is infinite, but in humanity is finite. That means that doesn't make any sense, bro. That's impossible. 
So there, essentially the argument is two contradictory properties cannot exist together in one person. And our response will be, so for example, can water burn on fire? It, it cannot, right? They have contradictory properties. However, we can, we can actually observe a fire burning on water. And uh, if you look at petrol accidents and whatnot, and how does that happen? Well, because there is now an instrument that allows fire to burn on water. That instrument, you can say, is oil. So in that sense, uh, the fire cannot burn in water, but true oil as an instrument, the fire can burn on water. And I, I'm going to translate it in the context of Christ. The divine nature cannot, uh, cannot come into the human realm, but true human nature, the divine nature can become incarnate uh, in the human realm, in the person of Christ. So uh, I will... I will point that out. And uh, that should... Uh, and, and on a final word on, on, on the two wills, and then I'll move on to the Q&A on our theology. Although Christ has two wills, this does not mean that there are two psychological persons, but rather the one person utilizes both wills. Christ has human and divine inclinations, and you can say... Uh, divine and human reflexes, intuitions, if you want to say that. For example, he walks as man, but he walks on water as God, right? So the two the two wills and the two energies in, in, in certain actions are teandric, right? It's both energies that do the walking on water. Sometimes he just walks as a normal human being. Uh, he does miracles in his divine power, as St. Gregor of Nyssa says. Uh, and it is his single person, his single divine hypostasis that does these things. It's the single person that wills as a human or and as a as a divine uh or as God. And I'm not going to I am not going to read the entire section, but if you're interested, uh this section from the Byzantine Christ is 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 very good because Saint Maximus points out that the Garden of Gethsemane prayer is a very basic explanation of uh, the two nat of the two wills and how they operate. Right, uh, so the two natural wills operate properly, and uh, and for example, Christ in his human inclination wants to avoid death, right? Because our human or natural inclination is to avoid death. But the same in his same human willing, he accepts this. Uh, he accepts this. He accepts death for a higher purpose, to achieve that higher purpose, to accomplish the divine will of his father. Um, this doesn't mean that he deliberated between these things because Christ did not possess a gnomic will. Um, gnomic will means a deliberative will. Uh, it's a... It's a feature of created human hypostasis. It's a misuse of the human will. That is, there's a feature of our created human hypostasis. Because Christ is not a created human hypostasis, he does not have a gnomic will. So he did not deliberate. Uh, but rather, as an example for us, in his humanity, he accepted uh, the crucifixion, the passion. And St. Maximus points out that the, that the prayer at Garden of Gethsemane is a great proof of the two wills in Christ. And this should... Uh, this should be it for or Christology. I know it took a bit too much of a time, so I'll I'll give you guys 10, 12 minutes or so. Uh, you can ask questions. So we have into the Q and A section right now. The next after the Q and A, we're going to be talking about monophysite terms and and meanings. If there's if there are anything that you want to ask me, anything that confuses you, any clarifications that you want, uh, you can go ahead. I will, uh, let me see. Yes, I will uh, enable speech and voice activity for everyone in this voice channel right now. Uh, if you can speak, okay. I think someone unmuted, so I can hear you. So if you I have any you questions, have... you can go ahead. Yep. Sorry, David. Um, I was going to say, you may have gone over this. My phone kind of cut out and glitched out for a second. But um, and if you did, I'll just go back and watch it. But the non-Chalcedonians, why are they so obsessed with trying to say no? We just have different definitions of things. Well, um, they, they, they we do we do have different definitions of things. That's true. But the thing is, it's very easy to not read anything 
and to assume that both are just the same because uh, a lot of people, and I mentioned this in the first lecture, a lot of people confuse what they want and what they get as a result. So I, I talked about this. If you ask an historian and a Kyrillic Chalcedonian Orthodox Christian and an Oriental um, non-Chalcedonian, right? If you ask them, what do you think of Christ? What is Christ? They will all say the same thing, right? In their meaning, right? They all, in, in their mind, for them, Christ is one person that is fully God and fully man. That is what they want in their system. The problem is not what they want. The problem is what they get in their theology. And the point of the theology is to get what you want. And a lot of people confuse these th these two things. They just think, oh, just because I said, oh, just because I said one person, two natures, or one person, fully God, fully man, that, that means I'm Orthodox now. It doesn't work that, that way. We're not Muslims. We, you don't say the you don't say the Christological Shahada and become a, a Christian. It's much more nuanced than that. And so a lot of people confuse that, and that's why they resort to that kind of thinking. If you cannot uh, unmute yourselves, you can, I think you can rejoin, uh, but anyone, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, I have one more follow-up um, mm -hmm. on that is, uh, so what's the, from our end, right? What's the importance that you would communicate to a non-Chalcedonian from the uh, Orthodox well, conception? As in, can you elaborate, like, as in... What would, exactly? um, yeah, like, like, um, how would you communicate the importance of them being non-Chalcedonian versus being Orthodox? Like, they'll okay. say, like, oh no, it's not the not a big deal. Like, it's you know, like I just said, and like you just said, they'll say, oh yeah, it's just different definitions. It's really not a big deal. What would you? How would you approach showing? Like, no, the importance is X, Y, Z. Okay. Um. I will give them multiple different reasons and you will see the reasons in the next section because that's going to be the real meat, right? I'm I'm keeping the I'm keeping the good stuff for later, which is going to happen next. But the first okay, thing cool. I Okay, cool. Don't say, let me yeah, spoil yeah, yeah, my yeah. appetite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I won't spoil, don't worry. I uh, I'm just going to say I will say first of all, you don't get what you want. I understand that what you want is one Christ that is fully God and fully man. I know you want that. What you don't you can't get that because you're you're Chalcedon because Chalcedon brings you that kind of Christology in a very consistent line. Not just Chalcedon, but other councils as well, the entire Orthodox councils. I will say, for example, in your system, the implications of your system results in things that you don't want. And we will be covering those implications. Those implications are actually, funny enough, it's going to be Nestorianism or Eutychianism. It's going to, it's going to be Universalism. It's going to be Tritheism. These are all the implications in your systems that you don't want, but it consistently, logically speaking, leads to that. So I will say, when you reject Chalcedon, and when you have the kind of definitions that you have and the kind of metaphysic that you have, you cannot get what you want. You cannot achieve the Christology that you want, which is why your position is heretical. And if you have a heretical position, and if you're outside of God's church, you're not going to be saved. So I'm sorry, but... If you know these things and you still decide not to be orthodox, if you don't repent from your errors, I'm going to say it very simply, you're not going to be saved. You're, you're going to not be in a good spot. I'm not saying that every single Oriental is boom, instant hell, or every single person outside. I'm not saying that either. I'm just pointing out that if you know the differences, if you have the opportunity to know about it, the, the kind of brain power to do that, and you refuse to do it, and you just keep... And you keep your position where you just say, oh, we're just the same or whatever. And you refuse to join the church. Like when you say stupid things like, oh, Chalcedon is not heretical. We just don't accept it. And I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, but you're outside the Ark of Salvation and you're not, do, you're not trying to get inside that Ark of Salvation. You're not going to attain salvation. You're going to die in a not so nice place. Um, People don't like it when you tell them like this. It it makes them afraid. It makes you think that I'm I'm fear mongering. But it's what's going to happen, and that's why we do these things. It's why we baptize babies. It's why we it's why we try to help people have correct orthodox understanding of theology. It's so that we can keep people safe and we can keep people profess the true united faith. So that's kind of what I will say at first. Uh, does that answer your question? 
It does. Thank you. All right. Could you please repeat the order of the text where the Garden of Gethsemane prayer can be understood further? Okay, the book that I uh, referenced from is called Byzantine Christ, in short. It is written by Demetrios Patrelos, um, the, the person who goes over the importance, the, the person he's quoting, who goes over the importance of the Garden of Gethsemane, is Saint Maximus the Confessor. And as I said, a lot of these things I'm talking, I talked about here, I've talked about in, in videos as well. I'm trying to kind of con, uh, compile it or expand it a little bit further. But it's Saint Maximus the Confessor that expands, and you'll find it on Byzantine Christ by Demetrius Petrillus. And I want to also say, um, I will be putting book recommendations. I'll, I'll be compiling not today, but very soon. I'll I'll compile it. It'll be pinned in the academics chat or, or whatnot. There's already kind of like a prototype of what I'm thinking and you can access all of what you need through those book recommendations. Uh, so yeah, does anyone have any other questions? Okie dokie. If not, then I'm, I'm not going to hold you any longer. Let's get to the... Let's get to the good stuff then. Let's get to the fun, polemical stuff. This section is going to be about uh, non-Chalcedonian Oriental Christology, right? And their theology in general. So before we start, we have to understand what their terms mean, right? They're, they, they, we use the same terms, but the definitions are different. And I will even go as far as to say we knew they were different in some regards. But in some regards, they're also similar. So, again, for non calcinous hypostasis refers to a particular concrete existence. Um, but hypostasis is distinguished in two. One is a self-subsistent hypostasis. Uh, and a self-subsistent hypostasis is synonymous with prosopon, meaning person. It is a concrete individual existence that is named. It doesn't need to be united with something else in order to exist. In order to subsist, it can subsist by itself. So we human beings, we're made of body and soul in this scheme. And because we're made of body and soul, uh, we become a composite self-subsistent hypostasis um, in that view. So we become a person, right? Through that union. A non-self-subsistent hypostasis is a concrete reality that doesn't exist on its own uh, and needs another thing to subsist with in order to exist. Uh, so, for example, in, in the person of Christ, in the system, for them, Christ's divine hypostasis is self-subsistent. Christ's human hypostasis is non-self-subsistent because there, it is not a person. It, needs to, it, it exists only in the context of its unity with the divine nature for them. Uh, so that's also important to, to understand. And, uh, for example, the body is not self-subsistent. Without the soul, the body doesn't live. Essence, usia, is a common nature, common existence, you can say. It refers to the general, the species. So, so for them, usia is the same. We, we, usia is the same term. Kind of. Kind of. And I'll explain in what way the, the distinction is. Uh, I forgot to edit the channel back because I think someone's mic is... Uh, active. Uh, give me a couple of seconds. All right, there we go. And and I will I will even copy paste the 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 thing in here. Let me see. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> and Peter Farrington, who's a uh, one of the very few. OO scholars in, in Anglosphere says that uh, he quotes there, says, Usia signifies a generality and hypostasis a particularity, but being in nature introduced sometimes a general signification or sometimes a particular one. Um, so this is from Peter Farrington. And uh, the the book that I'm quoting from right now is called Three Monophysite Christologies uh, and this book in part, it's a very good book. Three Monophysite Christologies is a very good book that you should get. It's written by Chestnut um, and Roberto Bondi. And they go over 
the Monophysite Christology, the dogmatic Monophysite Christology in a in a very well written manner most of the time. So they point out that the term prosopon is equivalent to self-subsistent hypostasis. So personhood, self-subsistent hypostasis, it's the same thing. Um, and and there's a detail here. Uh, numeration, therefore, is a characteristic of uh, self-subsistent hypostasis. So what does that mean, right? So uh, they don't number the human nature because it's not self-subsistent. So it is not numbered. That's why they say one nature, one hypostasis, one prosopon, and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and because at the same time, because the human hypostasis, the humanity is not numerated, so are the aspects of humanity, will, energy, and whatnot. They're also not enumerated. And the implication of this is very simple. Will and energy, these things become proper to person, not nature, right? So again, a, a self-subsistent hypostasis meaning person, which Christ uh, in their system is, he has divine will, he has uh, a divine energy, but because the human nature that he's united to is not numerated in the scheme, uh, we don't talk of a human will or a human energy. Thus, he only has one will. So the monophysite position is monophylite. Uh, one of the uh, one of the footnotes in here says that f the two distinct operations of the two natures of Christ within the union to Severus is one of the more obnoxious implications of the Tome of Leo. So Severus's criticism of the Tome of Leo is not just that it speaks of two natures, but it also speaks of two energies. He does not like that at one bit. So uh, there is that to consider. So again, now that we established that they are they are monophylites, uh, how they understand union, the union is of two hypostases. Uh, so when, when they say hypostatic union, it is different from how we understand hypostatic union. For them, for us, hypostatic union is a union in the hypostasis. For them, hypostatic union is a union of the hypostases. And in letter one, Severus says, he performed all his own acts in it. This is from Severus of Antioch, who is the main, uh, mainstream, the main Thomas Aquinas of uh, Oriental Orthodox. He says, he performed all his own acts in it and changed it in, not into his nature, but into his glory and operation. Um, in, a, in many regards, I believe this is a Kirlian quotation, so in many regards he quotes St. Cyril, but his further... Metaphysic kind of implies that the divine nature subordinates the human nature. And we will go into detail in, in, in what manner does this happen. So, Christ is one nature out of two natures. So, for Severus, of two natures is an orthodox expression, right? Of two natures or out of two natures, right? They're orthodox. But for him, in two natures isn't. So when we look at so far, the Christological model is very similar to Nestorianism. Um, for Nestorius, it is also two hypostases, but the distinction is very minor, but it's very key. For Nestorius, the human nature is also self-subsistent because, because in his mind, the human nature has to be a full human nature, so it has to be self-subsistent. Therefore, um, uh, there are two hypostases as well. So for Severus, it is not self-subsistent. Uh, and this is where they differ in, in their understanding of the union. So for, for Nestorius, because the two hypostates are self-subsistent, there's a union of prosopa. Uh, thus, the union of Nestorius is a prosopic union. For Severus, one of, only one of them is a prosopon. So the union is, is of hypostasis, not prosopon, of not of persons. This is a quote from Severus, uh, letter 2. I will be reading the uh, important part of this letter. Accordingly, we say that from it and the hypostasis of God the Word, the ineffable union was made for the whole of the Godhead and the whole of humanity in general were not joined in a natural union, but special hypostasis. Right? So there are two hypostases that are united. Now let's talk about how Severus understands distinction and division, right? Because this is very key for us to understand why he rejects our system so much. Because for Severus, 
duality necessarily introduces division because of some form of plurality. So uh, in letter 18 to the monks of Tufa, he says uh, duality is a dissolver of unity, right? For duality is a dissolver of unity. Uh, he in this 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 book that I'm about to quote is from Ian Torres's book Christology after Chalcedon. It deals with Severus and Sergius's correspondence with each other, their letters with each other, and uh, he points out again in this in this section. Uh, he points out uh, in a duality, everything is cut at the same time, meaning everything is divided at the same time. And reduced to a diversity which is divided and cut in everything. Whether you speak of activities or properties. So if you speak of two properties or two activities, you're basically dividing them. For when we denounce the division resulting from a duality of natures. So for him, right? For resulting from a duality of natures. After the union, we do not, as you have taught, instead introduce as evil men advocate uh, the phrase two united natures. But we say what is indisputably the case, namely that duality is cutting and division. Very key for us to understand. So for him, the word two, right? The moment you speak two or three or four or five, you're speaking of division. So plurality for Severus is division, uh, which means that distinction entails composition so far. Uh and this explains why in his system he is obsessed with oneness in, in all regards in, in completely strict senses. Which makes our job very easy, right? So for the, the job for us is to prove that you cannot speak of Christ being God and man in his system. So, and also, it is also on us to prove that in his system, even though he runs away from a duality, he still nevertheless gets some form of duality. So that is on us to prove that this is the result of this Christology. Uh, now, in, in his responses to the Kyrillian Florid Legends, now Kyrillian Florid Legends were a collection of quotations uh, from St. Cyril that Chalcedonians collected, where St. Cyril of Alexandria speaks of two natures. And in fact, um, Alloy Grillmeyer in one of his Christ and Christian tradition books points out, and I will be posting that eventually, he points out that Severus couldn't respond to all of them. So he was very troubled with the earlier, especially the earlier Kirlin uh, quotations where St. Cyril explicitly speaks of a distinction, explicitly speaks of a duality. Uh, he, he really did not have an easy time answering that. But... Uh, one of the responses he gives, gives to the Kyrillian floor legend, he says, for it, Saint Cyril says here, it is not the case that the word who is from God in assuming flesh went forth as a man like us, and for this reason he is dubbed twofold. So this quote basically, Kassadon said, well, he says twofold, the twofold refers to the nature, so two natures, so you should join us. Saint Cyril says the same thing. His response is basically, from St. Gregory of Nazianzus, and he quotes St. Gregory of Nazianzus, who says, Now he was sent, but as a man, uh, for he was twofold. And then he quotes what when he said a little earlier on, Now then, God went forth with the assumption of human flesh, the things which were contrary to one another become one out of two. Now, as you can see, his argument is incredibly childish, it's incredibly stupid, and only a mind, and only someone with an IQ below 80 or someone who's dishonest will make this argument because it's a very stupid argument. It shouldn't even be respected. Let me explain what he's basically saying here. His argument is, oh, but St. Gregory of Nazianzus says the two realities become one. He's one out of the two. So that means uh, the twofold, like speaking of the him, him as twofold, it only refers to him before the union. Which is, again, a very bad argument. But they still use this argument today. They still make this point, not understanding that just because he is made one out of two doesn't mean that he's not also... I mean, again, God is one and three, right? If you say God is one, you're not abolishing his trinity. You're not abolishing the trinity by saying God is one. And you're not abolishing the oneness of God by speaking of him as three. So this logic does not cut it. It's a very bad logic, but that's how he understands it. For him, twofoldness is a feature of 
the pre-union, not the post-union. Not, not that. Further on, in his, uh, in his letter 10 to Eleusinus, uh, he says, You say of the mystery of Christ that you do not recognize the difference of the natures. And I'll, I could read more over, but I'll read the important part. Um, he, uh, the important part is that he says, For here the difference is understood also division. And again, from the difference of the qualities which naturally belong to each singly, we recognize division. When therefore out of things that differ in kind and are not of one essence with one another, the suprasensual, I mean, and the perceptible, for example, a combination or natural union takes place in order to make up one animal. As we see in the case of man, the division into two ceases. So this is very key to us to understand. So not all distinctions imply division for Severus. So this is very important for us to understand because you don't want to get, you don't want to fall into this trap. He qualifies this, this language. He says, if two things are united and they are of distinct essences, if they're not consubstantial, then um, there is no division, right? So body and soul, they unite. They're of different natures. When they unite, they become one. They become truly one. So there is no division. We don't speak of, the, uh, of two-ness in that regard. So when we speak of body and soul, we can kind of refer to them body, soul, but we refer to them in oneness, right, in his system. And some of you uh, might be quick on the uptake and might have been asking this question for a while to yourselves. How does this apply to the Trinity? Like, let's apply this to the Trinity. What does that mean? What does it mean? And we need to, again, look at letter 10 in, 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 in huge detail. Things that are united that are not consubstantial, right? Not of one essence. If they're united, there's no division. But if there are two things that are united where there is a where there is a um, consubstantiality between the two things, then there is a division. The persons in the Trinity are consubstantial. The persons in the Trinity uh, being consubstantial, are they divided? Now, all for, for us, again, if we speak of the person, the Trinity has divided, then that necessarily entails tritheism, and we don't want that, right? Uh, we do speak of un, undivided divisiveness in the Trinity. It's a Cappadocian statement, but what it refers to is that basically they're distinct without division, right? So there's a distinction of the persons, but they're no, they're not, they're not, there aren't any divisions of the persons in the Trinity. In four different instances, in letter 19, letter 22, uh, uh, letter 19, letter 22, letter 23, and letter 62, and I will be posting all of these letters here, and you can go find them from the E.W. Brooks set on Severus of Antioch. Uh, he says the persons in the Trinity are divine, and I'll read one of them, uh, but he says it's, it's, it's in all of the letters. Uh, I'll read the key parts in all of this. So in letter 19, the key part, he says, oneness of essence and that of the division of hypostasis by the same expression, both union and division in one word. Letter 22, he says, the, uh, according to the letter for the Romans who are very wise are infected with profound errors, not knowing that in essence, the Trinity is incapable of either of numeration or of division, but in respect of hypostasis, it is both divided and separated. Le letter 23, the, uh, there is a holy trinity divided and distinct in hypostasis, but not divided in one essence. Letter 62 to Count Isidore. Uh, but they call the trinity coessential in order that by means of this word, so plain and very excellently, stated that there might be expressed in the same phrase, both the oneness of the essence and the separation of the hypostasis. And by means of this one word, unity and division. So for instances, he accepts that the persons in the trinity are separate. So again, some, again, you might say, oh, but the Cappadocians use the same expression. We have fathers that use the same expressions. But the way they qualify, again, the way they qualify and the way Severus qualifies his expressions are different. There are different qualifications. We will say the person in the Trinity are undividedly divided. Whereas he will say they are undivided in essence, divided in person. Which is no different from us. We are, I mean... We share the same essence. We are consubstantial, but we are divided by person. I mean, it's not exactly, but it's basically very similar to how we are divided. 
And so in his system, if you apply to triadology, you end up with tritheism. And that is why you have people like John Philoponus later on, who's a monophysite, espousing tritheism. Because who did he come to these conclusions from? Who did he read to come to these conclusions? He read Severus. That's how he came to these conclusions. And uh, that's why he's a tritheist, right? And so... Uh, yeah, Cappadocian qualification is not only in the level of Usia, but also hypostasis. The Cappadocians, this is very key, Cappadocians don't consider a dyad or a triad as inherently divisive. So that is also another problem for them. Severus explains that for him, division is a feature of hypostasis of the same kind. The Cappadocians, I believe, never say these things, right? Um, so this, this division is different. Now, on the question of whether we can speak of Christ as one usia or two usia, um, one essence or two essence. So, if you read Severus's correspondence with Sergius the Grammarian, you will notice that uh, Sergius is speaking of one mixed essence. So, Sergius is Eutychian, basically. Uh, whereas, uh, Severus of Antioch uh, understands that this is not something that he wants. He realizes, look, we can't, um, we can't really, because we have to protect dual consubstantiality, right? He, even he understands that there needs to be a protection. Timothy Elurus, for example, speaks of dual consubstantiality. So dual consubstantiality is a feature of their Christology. But the question of whether he has two essences or one essence is kind of the implication. And and that's this is what I want to cover right now. And... Uh, Timothy Eulerus, for example, who is a monophysite patriarch of Alexandria, he succeeded Dioscorus, I believe. Um, not, not Dioscorus, but he, he, he was in the 5th century. He says, On the fact that one must assert as one or Lord and God Jesus Christ with his flesh and must assign everything to him, what is divine and what is human, and that he became consubstantial with us according to the body, but also remained God, and that it is godless to separate him into two natures. Right? So you understand that he wants to protect a divine consubstantiality. I put the quote, full quote in Manafsite lecture notes. And then he says, it is impossible, and this is the problem, it is, it is impossible to call the life-giving flesh of our Lord the second nature of the God Logos or a second essence. So Timothy confuses nature and essence. in his. So he, he confuses hypostasis and essence more so. He considers them the same thing. And so from, from Timothy Ehlers, we understand that he tries to respond to the to the charge of you can't do a du dual consubstantiality and he fails to do that. He basically denies that Christ is two usias. Uh, and if you read his argument further on, his argument is really bad. He basically says, if you speak of two natures, then you say the human nature is divine nature too. So you're idolatrous, which is a very bad argument. Right? He completely does not get that for Casadonis, we attribute the suffering as a proper, as a feature of the human nature, but the person's suffering is still one and the same Christ. So there's no division there. Um, Severus, in his attempt to uh, to speak of dual consubstantiality, also similarly fails big time. And I actually do want to read this whole, uh, all of these, all of these screens because it is, it helps you understand the root, the way he commits this error. <clears throat> uh, and give me a break. I'll. So Severus says, Why do you suppose that you will escape agreeing with Nestor's opinion inasmuch as you affirm that you acknowledge Christ in two substances? So, we can notice from here John the Grammarian's argument. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of summarize his argument for you. John's argument against Severus, John is a Chalcedon, his argument is, look, all Chalcedon did is use Cappadocian terminology for the Trinity and apply it in the context of Christology. So if we speak of two natures, all we mean is two essences. <coughs> you affirm dual consubstantiality, therefore you should also say he is in two essences. And Severus says, uh, no, actually, I don't. 
He says, for behold, he himself also expounded the phrase into natures as into, into substances. So he basically says, Nestorius said, Nestorius by saying into natures meant into substances too. So you can't escape from Nestorianism, which is a very bad argument. Because St. Cyril says not everything a heretic says is heretical, right? But if you take refuge in the generic signification by which we understand substance as a compendium of many hypostases, then by the vanity of your reasoning, you will be imprisoned in such folly and wickedness as to declare that the substance of the Holy Trinity was incarnate in the substance and the whole genus of humanity. Keep this in mind. I'll, I'll come back to this because this is where he basically makes an historian argument here and we'll see how. He says later on, Behold, we have plainly demonstrated how when we make the statement out of two natures, we do not understand these natures as substances according to the general signification that they hold together many hypostases, in such a way that it be found, according to your wicked humbug, that the whole that the Holy Trinity was incarnate of the whole of humanity and of the whole human race. Right? But one hypostase of God the word by which by contemplation alone may be separated, and one hypostase of flesh rationally and soul and itself from the Virgin Mother of God. It's, again, what does contemplation alone mean here? Does it mean the same thing for us or does it mean something different? Right? That's also another question. Uh, then he says, he quotes John of Constantinople, this living creature man is twofold, since he is compounded out of two substances, for they used to employ the generic term substance for the signification of a particular. So he basically says, by say, St. John Chrysostom, just when he said substance, he actually meant person or hypostasis, which is, that's a, that's a push, right? And whenever the fathers are accustomed to speak of one particular hypostasis, they speak of one substance, and it says, Christ subsists in two natures or substances. This oh, Now we have said these things without restraint to show that those who affirm that Christ subsists in two natures or substances designate him as twofold like Nestorius does, but not like those orthodox teachers who were before him, who acknowledged him out of two natures as the son who was incarnate without change and perfectly made man. Because after St. Cyril's refusal, we always and in every way abstain from speaking of Christ as twofold. So to summarize, he basically says you can't speak of Christ being into substances because first of all, Nestorius did this and that will mean that the entire Trinity was incarnate with all of humanity. Million dollar question from me to you. Who made this argument that Severus just made? Give me a name. Give me someone who made the same argument Severus of Antioch made a century ago. Think of that a century ago. Also a heretic. He's also very stupid. And uh, he was anatomatized. This heretic is known as Nestorius. Nestorius makes the same exact argument as Severus makes against the Orthodox. So he says, If God the Word became flesh, then all the Trinity must have become flesh since the Trinity is bound together as one nature. Right? So again, what he's saying is the Trinity is bound together in one nature. They're united in one nature. So if Christ became man, if there's a unity of the two natures, then the entire Trinity must have been united. And by that logic, you know, honestly, the entire humanity should have been united too. And here's what Father John McCuckin says about this. This sounded in the popular forum, both at the street level and the conciliar chamber, where it was cited as evidence of his present state of mind since he will not attend to speak in his own defense, as capable of bearing only two possible interpretations. The first one was that the Archbishop of Constantinople was theologically illiterate. So, a century ago, when Nestorius made this argument, they thought Nestorius was an idiot. A, a century later, Severus makes the same argument, and all these monophysites think he's a genius. Which goes to show what, like, in what state we have, de they have really de devolved into. So this is a very huge contradiction in Severus's system, and I and I showcase to you, I, I want to showcase it to you because Severus denies that Christ is one essence, but when when he is called to speak of two essences, he doesn't want to do that either. He's very very uncomfortable in doing that, and. That is what one feature I want to explain to you. So let's recap what we have so far. What, let's, let's recap what we have gone so far and then we can get into the big objections. My big objections to Severus. So far we understand that Christ is one nature 
out of two natures. Um, the human nature is non-self-subsistent, whereas the pre-existing divine nature uh, is self-subsistent, right? And, and thus he becomes a composite self-subsistent hypostasis, right? Out of two natures. Or one nature, right? You can also say that. Nature hypostasis for them is synonymous. Um, right? The universal exists in the particular. So the universal is kind of nominal. It's it's quasi-nominal, which means that the that that um even if you said two substances, it will not indicate an actual duality because it's only a verbal duality. So in essence, usia is just a compendium or collection of hypostases. It doesn't really mean anything more than that. Um, and because the general exists in the particular, the common and the particular are not really distinct. So remember what Paul Ibrahim said, the distinction between hypostasis and nature is like distinction between particular and common. So then there's a common humanity and then there's a particular humanity. And in reality, they're just the same thing. The distinction of the particular is that it acquires new characteristics. But if you remember what we talked about before, right? If a person is just a concrete essence with particular characteristics, then the characteristics also become essential characteristics. So either everyone is the same person that is consubstantial, or every every distinct person is also a distinct essence, which also leads to either tritheism or, you know, uh, modalism, right? And because the divine nature is self-subsistent and the humanity is not, the humanity is not enumerated, and the, the properties of, uh, you know, property, will, energy, they're all features of person, not uh, not nature. They're all features of a prosopon, which means that the divine nature, you can say, fully subordinates and owns uh, the human aspects, the human faculties, which is why Christ in the view is it's, it's monophylite. This is why there's one will. This is why there's one energy in their system. Uh, now, I want to express to you eight objections that I want to give to this Christological foundation. Uh, number one, and if you read, if you listen to my debates, and if you, uh, if you listen to my debates and my videos, you will know what I'm talking about. Uh, you will, you will know some of this, some of the arguments I make here. Number one, the hypostasis is composed out of two natures, right? Well, out of two hypostases, human hypostasis and divine hypostasis, and in their union. They're composed and they are one hypostasis. This union is unconfused, you say. It's they are uh they're not separate, they're not mixed. So they retain their identity. So here's my number one question. First question Is the hypostasis in and of itself created or uncreated? So if you ask us uh well actually I'm alright. So if you say it's created, then you mean the hypost then you're basically saying the hypostasis cannot be divine. Because what is divine cannot be created. If you say it's uncreated, well, it's vice versa. The human part cannot be uh, the human part cannot be uncreated. If you say both, right? Now that's the logical. Now that's the answer we will give, and I'll explain how, in our view, this doesn't lead to heresy. But they will say both, right? The hypostasis in and of itself is both created and uncreated. So here's the, so let me give you an example of a pencil. Think of a pencil. If you have a pencil near you, you can grab it and look at it. Um, you look at the part where, like the, the, the section, the part where you can write with it, like the entrance, the beginning of the pencil, the middle, and the end of the pencil. Just divide them into three in your mind. And let's... Divide them into sections. And let's say, for example, when I say the middle section, right? I say the middle section, the entirety of the middle section, right? If I say the middle section, I imply the entirety of it. The middle section is created. And the beginning section is uncreated. So now I've, I've named two different sections of the same pencil. There are two different sections where one is created, one is uncreated. 
So if you do this with the one composite hypostasis, if you say both, you have to say that there's one thing, there's one nature that is created and another that is uncreated, right? So you're going to say that the human nature is created, divine nature is not created, is uncreated. But the moment you speak of both, because one thing cannot be simultaneously created and uncreated, strictly speaking, you have to speak of two hypostases necessarily. You have to speak of two necessarily. Because as I said before, one thing cannot simultaneously be created and uncreated. So again, with the analogy of the pencil, think of the middle section. If I said it's the middle section, the entirety of it is created and uncreated at the same time, that will make no sense. It is in on that level, it's an either or, right? But if you if you if you distinguish it into parts and you say this part is created and this part is uncreated and therefore this pencil is both well you admitted distinctions you admitted plurality but technically you're also correct but they don't they don't do that so for example we will say if they ask this question to us is the hypostasis strictly created or uncreated we will say it is strictly uncreated the hypostasis in, in and of itself is strictly uncreated however if you're talking in general, like not strictly, but in general, because the hypostasis uh, has the human nature and divine nature in him, you can say both. The bothness refers to the natures because we speak of two natures, but they only speak of one. So it has to be either created or it has to be uncreated. And this is a huge problem, that the huge dilemma that they have to face. And this objection is from St. Maximus the Confessor, and he used this against Pyrrhus. He makes this objection against Pyrrhus. Neantis of Jerusalem makes this objection against Monophysites. So that's number one. Number two. If duality introduces division, does a triad introduce division too? And if it does, then how come this is not triatheistic? If it doesn't introduce division, then why does a triad not introduce a division? It's a simple question, right? And uh, if a triad introduces division, then, then that means triatheism. Right, then that means there are three gods, not one. Since Christ is a triandric hypostasis, uh, and he has no duality, right? He has one hypostasis, one will, and one energy. They all have to be one. There is no duality. What's stopping us from saying the usia, the essence, is also composed? What's stopping us from saying, oh, he's also one composed essence? What is stopping us from saying something like that? Nothing, right? Uh, and especially when you consider that will and energy are really proper to Usia, and there are two, it has to be to Usia as well, but they don't want to say that, so there's a problem there. Number four, what does distinction in thought mean? Is it a virtual distinction or a real one? If it's virtual, then the natures are confused, right? Because it's not a real distinction. It's not an actual distinction that's, that's actual. If it is real, right, if it is an actual distinction, then why don't you speak of two things, right? What is a distinction? Distinction is plurality. Distinction is where you say there is this one thing and this thing is not the other, right? If the natures are united and they're not confused, they are unmixed and there's no change, there's nothing like that, and when they come into unity, then the natures still by necessity have to be two, you still have to have two natures. Or actually, technically, three natures because now you have two unified natures and then you have a hypostasis as a result by that logic. But again, if the natures come into a unity, they're distinct, they're united, they're unconfused, they're unmixed, they don't change, then there's still a human nature and then there's still a divine nature in Christ, meaning there are two natures. Doesn't take a genius to figure this out, to be honest. Are self subsistent and non self subsistent? This is five. Is a non self subsistent hypostasis considered complete? It seems like a non self subsistent hypostasis is not complete because it lacks self subsistent. Um, and because self subsistent hypostasis is synonymous with prosopon and self subsistent and non self subsistent hypostases are not fundamentally distinct, then it seems to me that non, a non-self-subsistent human hypostasis in Christ is actually an incomplete human nature. Therefore, 
you actually don't have a complete human nature because it lacks a hypostasis of its own because you fail to distinguish nature and person. If you remember what I said before, before because we distinguish, we understand, uh, we understand the proper meaning of it. Is the soul self-subsistent or not? If the soul is, is self-subsistent, then the soul is a person, which is anthropological Apollinarianism, which means Apollinarius was actually right all along. If the soul is not self-subsistent, then how come the soul, when it separates from the body in death, exists divided from the body? So again, if you remember, if you're confused, what self-subsistent means is subsist by itself. So something that exists without being, without having the need to be united with something else. And if the soul can exist in death, separated from the body, then is the, then that means the soul is self-subsistent, right? Um, so that's a, that's the sixth problem. That's the sixth dilemma. Seventh problem. Is Usi and hypostasis distinct? According to uh, Paul, the guy I debated, their distinction is like a distinction between a common and a particular. But that will not be an actual distinction because it only distinguishes the mode in which the essence exists. So is essence and a person, are they really distinct? Is hypostasis and Usi, are they really distinct? Are they truly distinct or are they distinct in the same sense as a particular and a common? Uh, Paul, my debate opponent, said yes. And that means there is no real distinction between nature and person, which is, as St. John of Damascus says, the source of all heresies. Number eight, this is the final one. What is a hypostasis anyway? Is it a conglomeration of properties? Again, remember what Paul said. He said hypostasis is properties. If so, then how come are all then how are all humans consubstantial? Why does St. Basil in letter 38 say a hypostasis is not? a conglomeration, a collection of properties. So these are kind of like the eight problems that I'd uh, I'd like to list. Um, and I'll even I'll even put them in the notes so you can reread them in your in your comfort. Uh, and all right, let's move on with we actually what is wrong so far. So let's talk about the, the two oriental uh, saints that they have, these are not Severus of Antioch, but this is Damian of Alexandria and Peter of Antioch, uh, also known as Peter of Callinicum. They were 6th century patriarchs. Uh, Damian was from Alexandria. D Peter is the patriarch of Antioch. And they had Christological disputes with each other. And this is important to, to note because their Christological disputes is an outworking of how they view the... How they view, uh, Christology. And uh, I will just paste these two pages from Christ in Christian Tradition by Alloy Grillmeyer. And uh, in the debate, Damian of uh, Alexandria makes certain statements that I will say is very unsettling at the very least. Uh, so I'll, I'll read you the whole page. I'll try to read it as quickly as possible. Um, the friendly relationship between the two patriarchs, Damien and Peter, was severely disturbed and finally changed into open animosity when Damien sent a paper written by him against Tritheism to Peter, and Peter ventured a critique of it, even if a very polite and carefully formulated one. Damien's paper, perhaps attracted, is not extant, and so we can only deduce it from quotations. Um, this work by Peter, however, has not yet been edited. In the quarrel in the course of which Damien was accused of Sabellianism and Peter of Tritheism, there was never a reconciliation during the lifetimes of the two opponents. So the two opponents never reconciled. But they're both saints. They have contradictory views of the Trinity, but they're both saints in their own church at the same time, which makes, which is very interesting. I mean, people that didn't like each other did become saints. But on this level, this is kind of like saying St. Cyril and Nestorius are saints, which is what the Roman Catholic Church does. In the quarrel in the course of which Damian was accused of Sabellianism, which is modalism and Peter of Tritheism, uh, there was no reconciliation, and uh, let me. So they never reconciled. Damian asserts that the characteristic properties of the hypostasis, unbegottenness, begottenness, and procession of being possessed of the Holy Trinity, are the hypostasis themselves. So what does that mean? So the hypostatic property of being unbegotten is basically 
the father is identical being to being unbegotten. So there's a confusion of person and personal characteristics here. He said that uh, he said further that the general usi of the Holy Trinity, which is different from the hypostasis, is truly God. The three hypostases or persons, on the other hand, he recognized as God only in a metaphorical sense and true participation. So the persons are only God because they, sh they because they participate in the divine essence or something of that sort. Damien's position can be uh, lifted from the detailed headings of Peter's tractate. So I will be reading what he uh, he quotes from Severus and various other people. Um, here's what he says. He says, The persons of the divinity do not mean the divinity. It is polytheistic to recognize each person of the Holy Trinity as God. Let me read this again. It is polytheistic to recognize each person of the Holy Trinity as God. The hypostasis and the divine usia are in concept uh, are in concept different things, right? So he distinguishes usia and uh, hypostasis in concept. The hypostasis of the Trinity appear as a metaphorical concept without real existence. Damien calls the hypostasis Father, Son, and Spirit as names and titles, and seems to accept them only in theory, only in contemplation. And we can we can find this position already laid down in the synodical letter to Jacob Baradai, who says each person of the Holy Trinity exists precisely in its property without being mixed or mingled with another. The three persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit subsist without mixture or separation in their properties. Also the temporal independence and unseparateness, which he later adduces as characteristic of a hypostasis, which he later on basically says, they are identifies and says it's identical with the hypostasis. So, uh, again, you have this identification of the father, the confusion, not only of nature and person, but property and per person as well right now. Uh, so, unbegottenness equals the person of the father, whereas we will say unbegottenness describes the person of the father, but it doesn't define them. Um, so, there's that, I, I will say, huge mistake in their part. Now, moving on to iconic realities and, and uh, the kind of Platonism in, in monophysitism. Uh, let's go back to Severus. We are, we are quoting from Three Monophysite Christologies. Give me a... Uh, Got to drink water before I move on. Give me a second. So, for Severus, reality is divided in three different realms. Uh... There's the realm of the uncreated immaterial divine realm of God. The created realm of the intelligibles. This is where the angels are. And the realm of the visible material creation. So, hello, that's us. Uh, so, there are three divided, uh, divided realms, you can say. There are three distinct levels which stand in iconic relationship with one another. And so, when, when he applies this to the human will... The human will is an iconic representation of the divine will. Just as the body is an iconic representation of the soul, one is a perfect image of the other on another level of reality. So uh, the human will is basically the divine will, but it's it's like a puppet. You can consider it as kind of like this puppet that has its own features that the divine will controls, you can say. This means that the human will is an icon of the divine will. It's not a mirror image. Right? A mirror image will mean that there's two divine wills or it will mean that the human will is basically the same thing. It, it's not the same thing. It's a he, real human will, the he will say, but it's controlled by the divine will. It's functioned by the divine will. And this action, this position is monophylite. This is the monophylite position in the 6th century that we dealt with. So many monophylites will actually in, in, in language say there are two wills, uh, but... There's they, no not two wills, but they will say they will say there's a human will, but it's still only one will, right? So this is exactly the same kind of thinking here in in monophysitism. And now let's look at the let's look at the uh, implications of this. And I want to quote you from a book by a 
Monophysite uh, Patriarch. This is Pope Shenoda III. Uh, it's from his uh, uh, it's from his book Nature of Christ, the One Will and the One Act, and and he he says in this statement in particular. Uh, Okay, this statement is particularly what I want to focus on what he says. He says, The saints who are perfect in their behavior achieve complete agreement between their will and the will of God so that their will becomes that of God and the will of God becomes their will. So now their wills also become identical and it loses its own... And this is the kind of thinking that Stephen Barstut highly said where he said, If the wills become... If the will of God becomes our will then our substance also be necessarily becomes God's substance. So we also become God. But there's also a general issue here at hand. If the human will and the divine will can't exist together freely in a unity, and if, the, if, if they can only exist in the context of the divine will controlling the human will or being superior, subord uh, subordinating the human will, then what's going to happen in the, in the eschaton when we are united with God? Well, his divine will will override our human will. And so when we will as he does, we will all be saved. Essentially, the, 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 the implication is universalism. So if there's only one will in Christ, in the eschaton, there's only going to be one will and that of God. And since God wills the salvation of all men, that means everyone is going to be saved at the end, which entails universalism. Now, Severus does reject universalism, but he doesn't deal with this objection. Or my objection is that his position leads to universalism. And uh, and we're coming close to the end. Uh, this now next I'm going to be talking about Julian of Halicarnassus. Now uh, Julian of uh, Halicarnassus was a again a monophysite bishop, a contemporary of uh, Severus of Antioch, and. His position is known as the Aftartodokitist position. Uh, and it's the idea that Christ was impassable in his humanity uh, and that his human properties were distinct but not distinct. And yes, it sounds as stupid as it, as it sounds, but he basically said they're distinct in name, but really they're not distinct. They, they are, there's only one divine property is his argument. Uh, so, in, so their main difference is that Julian will say there's no distinction between the properties of Christ. And his argument specifically is this. His, his argument against Severus is that, Severus, you are an historian. He starts off with that. You are an historian. And he explains by saying, you believe Christ has two properties. You believe he has human properties and you believe he has divine properties. But if he has two properties, then he has to have two natures by necessity. And if he has to have two natures, then we're all wrong. Then Christ is two natures. Then the historians were right. And so we cannot agree with this, Severus. We cannot agree with this. And uh, Severus's answer is he basically says, no, I don't believe in two properties. I only believe in one property. But uh, he has human and divine properties, which is, again, not really a good answer. Because if he has human and divine properties, then he has two. Then it's, again, two. Human one, divine two. 1 plus pl 1 equals 2. Uh, I mean, even babies understand this level of mathematics. So, and, and he says about the developed properties, set corruptibility, impassibility, and mortality against incorruptibility and impass impassibility and immortality. And they lead him who is one into two Christ and two sons, since they falsify the inexpressible, incomprehensible union. This is what Julian says. And Severus says, now, in reply to these things, we shall say in short one simple true word. Show us that we have written somewhere that Christ exists into natures and into properties. But you cannot say so. Right? Uh, for, for we anatomatize uh, those who divide the one Christ in the duplication of natures and of their pro operations and of their properties. Uh, and again, the same dilemma how can Christ be impassable and passable and have two sets of distinct properties when you say it's one? How, how is it one when you have obviously two different sets? So that's another problem of Julianism that Severus cannot deal with. And I, and I will say Julian is more consistent than Severus. Julian is at least a bit consistent. He recognizes, wait a second, 
there's not even a real humanity in the first place um, in our system. So we should stop really kind of pretending that we believe that he just goes to the juggler. Um, and I want to talk, I want to kind of make a special note against Philosynics of Mabok. Uh, I'm going to come too close to ending it here because I don't want to spend too much time talking about this. But um, Philoxenus of Mabok was also a very important uh, uh, oriental saint. I should stop saying, uh, I'll, I'll stop. I promise. He's an important oriental saint. He, some people, uh, Roberta Bondi says she's an alternative to Ceres. I don't really agree. I think he basically says the same thing that's in a different language. So for Philoxenus, uh, when you look at the union of the body and the soul, he says that the body and the soul has two wills. Uh, as in like the body, there's a, there's a will of the body and then there's a will of the soul and that the body and the soul are intrinsically opposites, right? So they oppose each other. So they're definitely opposites and they're against each other. They're dialectically opposed. And, and by the way, if you if you want to look at like the sources, I the video on Severus, last section of that video, I deal with uh, Philoxenus of Mabok. So all of the citations are there. I'll post, post this in the notes there, but... That's Philoxenus's argument. So he says in the in in the case of the body and the soul, the union of them is because they're dialectically opposed to each other. They come to unity because of that. It's a unity of oppositions. And then he says, uh, they, there's a there's a combat even in this unity. There's a combat between body and the soul. And so if the body wins, it's a bad unity. If the soul wins, it's a good unity. So. First of all, he basically says the body is evil and then he says the soul is good. And he says the body is only good if the soul controls the body. Now, he the, the union of Christ's two natures is understood in this exact way as well. The, the divine nature takes place of the good soul and the human nature takes place of the bad, bad evil body that the divine nature is controlling and making it good. And... A lot of what he says is again, uh, and Philoxenus is also a materialist. Um, he believes that everything, uh, that that everything is matter. He says that the that the that the soul has matter. He believes that. So, for example, he even distinguishes uh, between matter. So, for example, he will say that the that the soul is tin, right? And the thinner the soul is, the better the soul is. So the heavier, the, the denser something is, the worse it is. Is kind of what Philoxenus' presupposition is. And even God, right? God is the thinnest and lightest of all material, but even God is material. Which means, in this system, that material is pre-existent, that there is no creation out of nothing, because material pre-exists as God because God is made of matter now in this system. And, okay, we can throw out Christian creation out of the window. So not only not only do we have to deal with monophysitism now, so now we have an originist at our hand. Now we have a pagan at our hands. This is a completely pagan system. But, again, in the in the treatment of Christology, Philoxenus of Manbuk openly states this. Right? He openly states this kind of, kind of a view. And, again, the body... Philoxenus states is the reality that opposes the soul and uh, and the soul's job the will of the soul is to control the body and uh, make it not cringe basically uh, essentially and in 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 asceticism our job then becomes to make ourselves lighter so we should become lighter uh, or soul should become lighter, or body should become lighter, and that's kind of like that's his. Uh, that's kind of why he's very much anti-gluttony. Gluttony is very much his focus because gluttony is the very definition of becoming evil. Because the heavier you are, the more evil you are in this system. Uh, and he says, by a wise dispensation, a portion of the spirit was placed in a portion of the body, and as the body becomes heavy with food. It draws and brings down the soul to it and hangs its own weight on it and ties and fetters the wings of the thoughts of the soul. But if the life, li life of the body be maintained constantly by a sparing use of food, it becomes light and purified and refined in the heaviness of its nature dwindles away and 
makes bright the soul which in it, which is in it and makes it glad and is more of itself obedient readily to its will. So if any of you have seen my talk on Orthodox faith and life in Christ, this sounds kind of similar, but it's not really similar because what he what we do, we when we talk about asceticism and spirituality, we derive it from our theology, whereas Philoxenus's method of theology is completely reverse. He looks at ascetical practices and tries to build up a theology from there. It is akin to trying to build up how the world was created by observing the natural world as it is right now without revelation, right? You're going, if you observe the natural world, you're going to say, God is crazy. What, are, what, is, what, is it, what is it with all of these deaths and evil going on around this world? Whereas with revelation, you will understand, oh, okay, the world was supposed to, the world's original state was much better. It's just that in its current state, we have made it evil. So just like that, he kind of, his theological progress is inherently wrong, which is what leads him to numerous different errors. And finally, the final quote I want to send, the soul and the body are in a mutual combat. And in the life of the spirit, uh, life of the spirit must aid his soul in the defeat of the body. So you must go ahead and defeat the body. The, the, as the soul and body are locked in mortal combat, not the video game, but like life and death fight, they are mixed together in a bad sense. And the soul is sometimes overpowered by the body. Gradually it withers up and becomes a slave to the body. All its energies and resources serve the body. And when, when the soul dominates the body, then it's a good union. Right? So the ultimate proper relationship in this context is a good relationship of the soul overpowering the body. Uh, and... And that should be it for Philoxenus' point. Final note, this is going to be the final section. And it's going to be dealing with the Agnote controversy. Um, this is from the 6th century. This deals with, I believe, Patriarch, Theo Patriarch Theo Theophilus of Alexandria and Themistius. And the, this controversy is in regard to the will of Christ. Does Christ have one will? How is this one will? Uh, and how does Christ have two knowledge or one knowledge? Does Christ have one mind or two minds? This is what it kind of deals with. And although the original texts are in either Latin or Syriac, there is an English introduction to this place. This is from the Monophysite texts of the 6th century. Uh, and I'm uploading, so I might be cutting off a little bit. But after this is uploaded, I'll, I'll start uploading the other one because... I got, a, I got a very slow internet, so <laughs> it takes some time. Okay, there we go. So, in the survive, so Themistius' uh, problem is that the, the, the Christ has one will. He rejects two wills, but this will has to be theandric, so it has to be divine human. Whereas Theophilus, uh, sorry, sorry, Theodosius, sorry, Patriarch Theodosius, he says the will of Christ is one, whether it's moved now in divine fashion, now in human fashion, uh, in this way, not differently, the knowledge of the one person is also one. So, Christ also simultaneously has only one knowledge. Uh, and essentially, what the result of this is, of the agnote controversy, is in regards to, does Christ deliberate? Does Christ have gnomic will? Does, it, does he not have gnomic will? So, Themistius says, Christ does have a gnomic will. Um, he does deliberate. Because he doesn't have full knowledge of all things. And he cites scripture. He shows how scripture, Christ grew in knowledge, right? Scripture says that Christ grew in knowledge and understanding as time went on. As he grew in his humanity. We will say, for example, that's a non-absolute limitation in his humanity. So Christ, in an absolute manner, still knows everything. He's still God fully. But in his humanity, he gives himself a non-absolute limit, meaning that he doesn't limit himself definitively but he um, empties himself you can say right Emp he empties himself and assumes the human condition and Themistis' argument is essentially kind of like that and Theodosius' argument is that that does not make any sense uh, I don't like your use of the word theandric either there's only one will of Christ only one divine will and divine knowledge Christ never underwent any of these conditions so this is another aspect of their debate that happened 
uh, and I and I just wanted to note that because it showcased to, to you, for example, before we even had to debate about no McNeil, because Orientals love to act as if they are united in everything. They love to act as if they're united. I mean, as historically speaking, that is, especially right, right now, but historically speaking, they love to act as if like, oh, you know, the, the issue of the vills, the issue of natures, the issue of icons, these are your problems. We already saw those issues. We never had those problems. They, they, they say these, but it's not true, right? On one hand, you look at Julian of Halicarnassus, whose influence existed even up to the ninth century, you look at Themistius and Theodosius's fight, where, where, where they were not certain where the will is changing. I mean, Theodosius says that the will is only divine, which Severus says it's divine human, right? In text uh, 28 to John the Hegumen, he says, he quotes from St. Dionysius and says the, the divine will and energy is theandric. And Themistius is simply repeating what he says, but they reject it. So, Bearing all this in mind, uh, that will be it for this, well, for the for the presentation so far. Uh, and uh, I believe I don't have anything more missing. Yes, I think I covered everything I wanted to cover in this lecture. Uh, if you have, uh, if you have any other questions, if you have any other questions, uh, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and ask them. I will allow you mic access right now. Let me change the permissions. Uh, let's go. Sensitivity. And then. All right. So you should be able to unmute yourselves and speak in voice chat. If you don't have a mic, you can type in lecture voice chat to ask your questions. And uh, and yeah, if you can't, if you can't unmute yourself, you can rejoin the voice chat and you should be able to unmute yourself so if you have any questions uh, now is the time it can be simple questions anything also remember guys you might be pushed to talk try that as well sometimes we've had that issue yeah, i'll start with a question maybe a bit stupid and maybe a bit off topic but can you um just summarize really quickly um what nomic will is and why Christ cannot have one. Okay. Just I, to clarify. I, yeah, I already mentioned it. I'll, I'll express in shortly. I'll, I'll try my best, although it doesn't... Usually I can't explain things shortly, but nomic will is a feature of the usage of will. It's a feature of creative human hypostasis. It means deliberation. It's, it's, prim it's main meaning in this context is that is deliberating between good and evil, right? So it's kind of like how Adam and Eve, they deliberated between good and evil because they are created human hypostases. And in, in a created human hypostasis, you deliberate, you, you're not certain what is good and evil, you're not certain which one you should follow. Sometimes you know what is good and evil, but you, you deliberate between whether you should follow the good. Right? And this is a feature of created human hypostasis. And Christ does not have a gnomic will because he's not a created human hypostasis. He's a divine hypostasis. And that's why although he has a natural human will, he has full knowledge even in his humanity because he does not possess a nomic will. So he knows what is good. He does the good because of that. He doesn't deliberate between whether he should do the good or not. Okay, so similarly that uh, in his humanity it can be possible, but that, he's, uh, but that he's not naturally subjected to death, that he has to take death upon himself. That's right? Yes, he assumes death. Um, he assumes okay, the blame okay, yes, so... assumes death, yeah. Yeah, so so that's how we can say that he assume all like you know because Saint Gregory is a theologian says what has not been assumed cannot be healed. Yes. Uh, so in that sense, we can say that he still assumed everything that we have, uh, but he just has it in a healed form, right? Okay. Any other questions? If you. Vlado is typing. I'll. Hello. Hello. Uh, who who said who unmuted? It was Lamel. Oh, okay. Um, Vlado asks, "What does Sabellianism mean that Damien was accused of?" Sabellianism means modalism. It is the belief that 
uh, God is one person in three different modes. So it's basically saying the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are the exact same person. They're basically the same person. They're just different modes of the same person. So that's what Sabellianism means. It's also known as modalism. Lamel, if you have a question, you're good to go, yeah? Yeah, I'm just trying to formulate it. David won't bite. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Second Ecumenical Council um, did away with certain heresies. Are all of these heresies having to do with um, the nature of the hypostasis and the Trinity? Um. Can you ask that again? I, I was I was looking at so, so do do all of the heresies in the second ecumenical council is dealt with? Do they all deal with the with the what? The trinity, the trinity, and the divine nature and hypostasis and things like this. Um, to my memory, yes, because they deal with eunomianism, which is a advanced form of Arianism. It deals with Apollinarianism, uh, which, as I said, is the belief that Christ did not have a complete human nature; he only had a uh, he lacked a divine mind or a rational soul or whatnot. And um, yeah, so I, I I think they, yeah, I think that will be correct. All right. Thank you. Another thing about ecumenical councils is that like, if they're, so they're usually associated with a person and the theology that that person expresses, um, so the Second Ecumenical Council kind of rubber stamps Cappadocian theology in general as well. David, I came in late. Will you be yes. making these lectures available uh, publicly? Like the uh, yes. recordings? Yes, yes, yes. They will, be nice. they will be published on YouTube. So you'll be able to check Brilliant. them out Brilliant. at any time. Thank you. I reckon it's a it's a new concept, so I think a little people uh, are taken aback. But if you're going to be doing them regularly, I think it's going to be part of the culture. And it'll be it's really good, be good content. Yeah, I mean, this this obviously will be awesome. wasn't this obviously wasn't perfect. Like I'm willing to admit that there's a lot of things I could have improved upon, but um, it could be a good thing. Like for something, I think I think the way the the lectures are good, will be served is a uh, dealing with something that's a little a bit shorter. I think I took a bit too long, like just talking. But Mapola asks, going off of that Nomicville question, will it be correct to say he deliberated? as in the case of the temptation in the desert, for example, freely choose good, or deliberation was not something even possible since Christ is fully God. I guess this is then from my confusion of how Christ called heal or say So he assumed the state of temptation. Uh, tempta being tempted is not a sin. Uh, so for example, if you get like a random image of a naked woman doing not, not nice things, uh, that's not like just randomly. That's not a sin. Engaging in it, with it now you enter the sin territory right so being tempted is not sin in and of itself uh he assumed that here's the thing christ did not have a nomic will but that doesn't mean he did not assume that condition right so what i mean by that is um he assumed the condition of for example christ knew everything right but he assumed the condition of like if when he was walking through the desert he assumed the condition of right like not knowing where to go and only humanly trying to come to the conclusion of uh, where he needed to go to heal or state again. And the temptations are a part of that. Now, I will also say it was impossible for Christ to just entertain the temptations. But in his humanity, that is exactly what we're supposed to be as well. We are supposed to not even be possible to entertain temptations. And that's why it actually makes sense that he was tempted, but yet naturally refused it and it will like in out of a million scenarios in million cases he will never be tempted he will never commit sin 
Um, and it is this divine assumption of our condition that ultimately defies us and makes us like him and allows saints to be the continuation of the life of Christ. All right, thanks. Uh, so, any any other questions? I'll wait for a couple minutes so people can come up with something, maybe. Yeah, well, we're waiting for questions. I think the 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 idea of you doing it regularly and your self critique of it not being perfect. If you do it all, more and more often, just you'll just inevitably get better, better timing. Um, mm -hmm. and is it okay if I ask questions yeah. on your next lecture about this lecture that I came in late to with the uh, Actually, this the is the final, this is the final lecture on this issue. Oh, my bad. Yeah. My bad. Uh, so yeah, I mean, again, uh, if you have any questions, it could be, well, well, yeah, John, John, John Candlewick. Yeah. I mean, as I said, even basic questions are okay. Like if there's something that you can't grasp that what I said, like ask them, I'll try my best because I'm not like, I, I kind of skip over stuff sometimes, I think. So even very basic ones can be good questions. If you have, if you want to debate or if you want to like question how our system is good or what whatnot. All is fine. I don't. Uh, I'm. I'm here to answer it for you because, uh, is, is another thing that like, I usually don't voice chat. I usually don't come on for voice chat often. So, uh, I I think I should, but so I so there's not really much opportunity for me to just do this with people. And is and again, a lot of people have like like usually we get these questions all the time about this like Oriental Orthodox Monophysite issue and whatnot. Like so many people have so many questions. And like, I think every single day people are asking at least one question on this issue in which prompted me to do this. While people are thinking of a, of a question, actually, I, I, I actually forgot to make one point and I think this is a critical point. Um, so if you remember the argument I made, which is about, um, oh yeah, the two, if, if in their system, the two natures are united, but they're not confused, they're not mixed and they have to necessarily speak of two because they're still distinct after the union, right? So if I was an Oriental, a smart Oriental will give an answer like this. He will say, okay, I'll bite. I'll, let's say it is like that. Let me ask in your regard, for example, uh, what is human nature? And the Orthodox will say human nature is a composite of body and soul. So human nature is a composition of two natures. And you say, yes, it's a composition of two natures that are not divided. They are united. They're distinct. They're not mixed. They're not confused, right? And I would say, yes. so then that means there are actually two natures, soul nature and body nature. And you just call them human nature. So technically speaking all human beings are two natures and christ actually has to have three natures by that logic and saint john of damascus deals with this question and he actually says yes uh but he describes he explains why we use one human nature why we speak of human nature as one he says technically speaking three natures is a correct statement if you mean to mean to say body nature and soul nature right we're not dividing the body. We're not dividing the soul from each other. They're still united and they become one. And that's the human nature. But the thing is, a body is not a species. Uh, body and soul are not species. Body, soul together, which constitute human nature, are a species. So that's why. So, so for example, there's no body without a soul and there's no soul without a body they they both kind of need each other to be united and they exist in the context of one human nature and a human nature is a species right there's human beings but there's no soul beings or body beings there's only human beings so human nature refers to species and, and divine nature right will refer to also species god and that is why we use this kind of language convention. This, that's why we speak of human nature as one. Uh, not, and 
So that will be your answer. Technically speaking, yes, three natures, if you said, if you qualify that way, that won't be wrong. But then, and as you can see, the problem is that doesn't refute us. For our system, it's completely consistent with our system because distinction does not entail uh, division. But then we will ask, we ask the question, okay, so again, I asked you the question, the human nature and the divine nature, they come into a union, they're not mixed, they're not confused, they're distinct. So are they, so you have to say there are two natures then, if they're distinct. That uh, question still is there and it's not refuted. So that's something I forgot to mention because um, that, that's, an, that's an objection that monophysites used at the time. <laughs> well, uh, if there are no questions, if there are no questions, I will, I will then end it here. Uh, most. Yeah, I will end it here if there are no more questions. Uh, as I said before, uh, the this Monafsa lecture notes uh, chat is going to be a living document. I will occasionally post there more often when I get more findings. I'm not going to be too much into it, but I'll I'll post there regularly a little, little bit. It will it'll be publicly available. I will make a book recommendation list the next day. Uh, so I'll, I'll refurnish the academy section on oriental orthodoxy uh and resources that you can read all the sources that i used uh these these sources are also in my uh and if you have any questions while i'm speaking i can obviously like we can we can talk about that but uh i will find let me let me find the let me find the video i did but i also have a video on severus of antioch if you type severus the real Medvite, you'll find it there. And that the description has a bunch of sources that I used. The PowerPoint slides has a bunch of sources that I use. If you want a complete explication of what I just said here, you can go check that video out. It is in VC lecture. Oh, I I should not have uh give me a second. Well, no, it's still the it's still the link. I'll post this in when I've set lecture lecture chat and I, if you have missed some parts of this i will be uploading this to youtube hopefully the next day um i will upload both of them at the same day most likely i'll basically try to do that and that should most likely be it and i want to finalize with uh before i before i close it here um, i want to say if there are anyone if there's any oriental that says you're a dumb poo poo pee pee head and I'm going to refute you, uh, try your best. I have said it to said it before. I will say it again. I am willing to as long as the topic is oriental Christology, as long as the topic is uh, as long as I get to actually have equal time if you're going to have a moderated and uh, as long as it's going to be on my channel and preferably only on my channel. You can have anything you want. You can have your own moderator. You can have your own team. You can have you can have like ten people debating with you. You can have a team of people in the background searching for citations and sources and whatnot. Do anything, okay? You can have you can have ten people. You can have two people, three people, four people, five people, ten people, twenty people. I don't care. You can have as many people as you like, as long as we get equal time, as long as it's on my channel, and as long as the topic is that. I don't care. We can debate. I'm willing to do that. And if you look at these debate conditions and say, well, uh, I can choose my moderator. I can have as many people I want to debate with as much as I want. So if he uh, does not so nice things, I'll have people backing me up, which is what these people say. that They say, oh, I, I'm not going to debate because he's a meanie. Yeah, imagine imagine coming up to Christ. Like, let's, let's assume that their view of God is true. Let's assume. For Humor me for a second. Let's assume their view of God is true. Imagine going up to Christ and saying, Well, Christ, um, I could not defend my fate because the person attacking my fate was meanie and I couldn't handle him. Uh, do you see how lame that is? That will be such a lame defense. And 
either defend yourself or admit that you're not willing to defend and you don't know what you're talking about. And a lot of people who don't know what they're talking about, they love being extremely insulted. I mean, every single day, that's the funny thing. Every My day, my daily life, I have to deal with my family and I have to deal with uh, what I have to do th this day, what video I have to do, what I've, you know, talking with friends, playing games, doing homework, going to university lectures. My day-to-day -day life involves this, okay? But it seems like the day -to -day, day daily life of these people, every single day, all they do is attack me in group chats and Instagrams, and I just get people sending it to me. And first of all, I'm sick of it. Don't send it to me anymore. But thirdly, uh, they do this every single day. I don't even think about them unless I get brought up. And the only reason I'm talking about this is because I get random people calling me antichrist, which what ha which is what happened yesterday. Some random dude called me antichrist. Uh, we have people just attacking me, calling me a liar, and I say, okay, look, calm down, let's debate and sort this out. And say, no, you're a meanie poop we had, and all that stuff. We have people saying, Medvite is dumb. I'll beat him, and I say, let's debate, and he runs away. I I, have, I don't want to deal with this stuff. Go away, okay? I don't want to deal with you people. You people are. Stupid. And that's the last thing I'm going to say. Either debate or I'm not going to care what you do. That's what I want to end it with. Either debate, either challenge me. Because it should be pretty easy to challenge me if I'm wrong. If I'm not wrong, then that's why you don't challenge me. That's, how, that's what I'm going to think. And that's what I want to end it with. It's complete soy behavior to take pot shots from af afar, not engaging with the person directly. It's, it's something a coward does. It's someone who who does not believe in his own God does. If you really believed in Christ, you will believe that he will be with you. Because I believe, I actually do believe that. I actually do believe that because I'm on the side of truth, because all of us are on the side of truth, Christ is with us. And Christ is going to defend us. And Christ is going to be with us. That's what he promised. I believe that. They don't believe that. So it's their problem. Having said that, I want to close this lecture with, uh, if we don't have any more questions, which we don't, I will close this lecture with a hymn to the Theotokos, and then I'll send everyone home, and I'll thank you for staying here. So, it is truly to meet you, me to bless you, O Theotokos, ever blessed and most pure and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without defilements, you gave birth to God the Word. True Theotokos, we magnify thee. So thank you all for watching this. Thank you all for listening to me. I appreciate you guys, how many of you were here. Um, if you have any questions next day, I, I hope I can deal with if I have the time. But uh, thank you all for listening. Hope you learned something new. And I'll see you guys in Discord or whatever. So thank you.